Welcome to Happy. Welcome to Disneyland and uh, welcome to Adventureland. It's probably my favorite land next to uh, New Orleans Square, if you want to count that as a land on its own. And uh, I want to show you guys around, uh, share a little, uh, share a few little known, not secrets, but some of the uh, lesser known attributes that uh, make it really interesting. So come along and check it out with me. Fun fact, the Tiki Room, the Jolly Holiday, and the Tropical Hideaway are all one building. So you can kind of see where they merge there. There's the Tiki Room in the front, Jolly Holiday to the side, and then right in the back there you can see the, uh, the Hideaway. One of those things is not like the other, right? You know, uh, Tiki Room is not a restaurant like the other two. But uh, the Tiki Room was intended originally to be a restaurant, a dining experience. And for that reason, it actually is one of the few attractions that has a bathroom on the inside. All right, starting with the Enchanted Tiki Room. And a lot of people like to shorten the name to Tiki Room or Enchanted Tiki Room, but the actual name of the attraction is Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room. And the reason for that is because Walt financed the entire attraction himself. The Tiki Room is the host to the first ever audio animatronics, and of course those are the uh, singing parrots in the attraction. They were a new concept at the time, so they had Juan, a Barker parrot, out front to entice people into the Tiki Room, but uh, they did away with him because he was so popular he was causing traffic jams. So back then, the birds were controlled by computers, and computers back in those days were massive. They were just floor-to-ceiling units, they ran on, uh, you know, the data tapes and, and all that good stuff, and they produced so much heat that the attraction was the first attraction to have full air conditioning inside the building. So the show is hosted by four macaws who have feathers that represent the countries that they come from. Uh, Jose, Michael, Pierre, and Fritz come from Mexico, Ireland, France, and Germany. Although we meet these guys in the Tiki Room, they actually live in the Tropical Hideaway next door. Let's go take a look. As you're entering the Tropical Hideaway, if you look down, you'll notice uh, that there's a tile mosaic on the ground that's a bit of a magic carpet. This is actually a remnant of Aladdin's Oasis. Uh, before it was Tropical Hideaway, this was Aladdin's Oasis where they had uh, dinner theater shows and then later like a meet and greet type experience with Aladdin and Genie and all them. And a corner of the hideaway is actually still dedicated to exotic lamp and magic carpet sales as a bit of an homage to his former identity. The Tropical Hideaway opened in 2018 and a lot of people know it as a good secondary place to go get Dole Whoops when the line over the Tiki Room is too long, but it's also the home of all the parrots. You have six of the girls who live above the restaurant, with the exception of Rosita, I wonder where she could be. Then you have our four hosts of the Tiki Room show. You got Pierre, Fritz, and Michael, and, uh, but Jose seems to like his privacy a little bit more. He hangs out on this post in the middle, and uh, the tassels of his home are supposed to have the colors of the Mexican flag. They're a little sun bleached, but uh, you get the idea. There's one parrot, though, who's a little bit of a traveling nomad, and we've only heard about her so far. I wonder what happened to Rosita. There's Rosita. Rosita's uh, hanging out at the tropical hideaway and she's waiting on a boat uh, from the Jungle Navigation Company to enable her solo career. So Rosita has a crazy rich history. She holds connections to several SEA attractions. We'll get to that in a second. She originates from the Tiki Room show, but she would never be seen until she appeared in the tropical hideaway. She'll talk to guests and she'll crack jokes. And uh, at the base of her perch is a crane and a Barker hat. That's a callback to uh, Juan, the original Barker parrot that uh, we mentioned earlier. She was seemingly dissatisfied with being part of the showgirl bird ensemble and not getting the spotlight for herself. So at some point she wanted to strike out on her own and uh, that's what she did. In her travels, she met Trader Sam, who named uh, Margarita after her, Rosita's Margarita, and it's not currently offered at Trader Sam's, but you can find some bartenders sometimes who still know how to make it. Around 1880, she found her way to the town of Tumbleweed, Arizona, in the Big Thunder Mountain region, where she uh, became under the ownership of the Big Thunder Mountain Mining Company as a mining canary. Uh, she skedaddled out of there, and in the 1930s, uh, found a home with the Enchanted Tiki Room, and Rosita got the idea to strike out on her own, start a solo career in music and comedy. She abruptly left the Tiki Room with her compatriots on the island, having no idea where she vanished to. But you can probably find her the next time you're enjoying a Dole Whip out here and uh, sit down and listen to a few of her jokes. In the back right corner of the hideaway is a wall with a bunch of paddles, and each of these oars bears the name of an SEA member who once owned the paddle. Hold on, this is a whole thing. 
All right, quick timeout. So here's the deal. I didn't have time to get into this in the park, but it's kind of important, so I'm back in the studio explaining it. I actually, this is the second time I'm recording this because there's a whole bunch to explain. And the first time I recorded, it was long and drawn out and boring, and I don't want you to skip the video. But the reason I'm sharing it with you is because Adventureland in particular is really heavy into the lore of the SEA and has lots of little Easter eggs and stuff like that throughout the park. So knowing just a little bit might enhance your enjoyment of uh, some of the little kind of fun facts and stuff like that. So. Who is the SEA? They are the Society of Adventurers and Explorers. No, scratch that. Society of Explorers and Adventurers. And they have a story that weaves throughout all of the major Disney parks throughout the world. Unlike most Disney stuff, where's, you know, they got movies and merch and all these, you know, facts that they push into your face, there's really not a lot explicitly laid out in the parks, at least not currently. So if you wanna know about the SEA, you have to go looking for it. And good luck with that because their history is extensive. It's like somebody saying like, yeah, quick, explain Lord of the Rings to me, but you got 30 seconds, go. So I'm gonna try my best to give you a quick short history of like the real life uh, origins of the SEA and then some of the canonical lore behind it. But that foray into the story is just gonna be the tip of the iceberg because it is long and extensive and it's really just a whole lot more than we have time to get into right now. Maybe future video, let me know in the comments, et cetera, et cetera. So the SEA originated from the Adventures Club, which is part of Pleasure Island, Walt Disney World. And when they shut that club down, they sent props from that all over to other parks in the world. Sorry. They sent props from that for all, to all other parks in the world and they kind of repurposed them into a story that uh, had roots with the SEA. The SEA was originally created for Tokyo Disney Sea with the Fortress Explorations exhibit. And you could go through the Fortress exhibit and learn a lot of the backstory and history of the SEA and it was a fun thing to do. But there was a much more aggressive effort to expand the story of the SEA when they opened Mystic Manor in Hong Kong Disneyland in 2013. There, there was a portrait of Lord Henry Mystic and his uh, sidekick, uh, Albert the Monkey. And there was also Harrison Hightower and a host of other uh, SEA members that had backstory expanding throughout the park and the rides there. And many of these were caricatures of Imagineers who worked on the project and they were sort of kind of the gatekeepers of the SEA lore. So that story with Hong Kong Disneyland really kind of springboarded the SEA into all the other parks throughout the world, including Disneyland here in Anaheim, California. Okay, so who are they? Who is the SEA? So the society was founded in 1538 in Porto Paradiso, Italy, uh, within the Fortress Explorations that we talked about earlier. And it was a bit of a secret society consisting of scientists, explorers, researchers, artists, travelers, etc., etc., and uh, adventurers from around the globe. But the most prevalent SEA members and their backstory really came into focus in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. And again, some of their backstories are way too long and involved to get into here, but some of the examples that you'll see throughout Disneyland are Barnabas T. Bolion and Jason Chandler within the Big Thunder Mountain region. And of course, for Adventureland, there is Dr. Albert Falls, who founded the Jungle Navigation Company, which is the company who gives tours for the Jungle Cruise ride in Adventureland. So there's touch points all throughout Disneyland uh, within Adventureland, within Club 33, Big Thunder Mountain, and uh, other areas throughout the park uh, that we'll get into later. All right, so that's just a very brief introduction to the SEA. So now when I talk about them, you're not like, what the heck is he talking about? And uh, you got a little bit more background on who they are and what they're all about. Everybody got that? Good. Okay, now back to the park and the paddles and stuff. So yeah, these paddles were owned by a bunch of SEA members, including Albert Falls, Harrison Hightower, and Henry Mystic. All right, so if you're looking above the uh, Tropical Imports sign up there, you'll notice up to the left is a little uh, tiki drummer styled after the guys in the Enchanted Tiki Room. Rumor has it uh, he was removed after refurbishment, so uh, he doesn't drum anymore. I think there's a Pete Best joke in there somewhere. Then if you're looking off to the right and up under this umbrella there is the uh, Jade Elephant. Uh, that guy or girl uh, gets around uh, quite a bit uh, initially over in Disneyland Paris and then uh, made 
its way over to the Gibson Girl ice cream shop, and uh, but in 2016, uh, moved over here and been there ever since. Let me share one small thing with you real quick. If we go over to the Indiana Jones queue and we look right under the sign for the Temple of the Forbidden Eye where the queue starts, you'll find a guy who was on top of the tiny home trend way before it came popular. This is throwback to the Little Man of Disneyland, the Little Golden Books book uh, that they was released back in 1955 about Patrick Begora, a little leprechaun who lived in the roots of an orange tree where Mickey and Pals wanted to build their new Disneyland park. He gave them the land in exchange for a home and a new tree, a theme that's reminiscent of a true-to-life tale about a tree that's not too far from this one. So if you're standing across from the Jungle Cruise, looking over at Indiana Jones, uh, right there at the uh, River Cargo Exporting sign, you'll have what is known as the Dominguez Palm. The Dominguez Palm's been alive since the 1800s. It's a Canary Island date palm that was planted as a wedding gift in 1896, nearly 60 years before Disneyland opened. Back then, this land was part of the Dominguez family's 10-acre orange farm. The tree's original location became part of the parking lot, and the parking lot was later replaced with Disney California Adventure. So the spot where the tree was planted was probably somewhere under soaring around the world. The tree played a central role in generations of family photos for the Dominguez family, and they hated the thought of it being destroyed. So the story goes that when they sold the land to Walt Disney, they had two conditions. One, Walt had to hire their son, Ron, who actually turned out to be a pretty good hire. He hired, started as a ticket taker in opening day and retired as vice president in 1994. Walt then moved the huge tree over to Adventureland, where he thought it would be right at home. And the palm tree has grown so large that the Jungle Cruise building next door has been trimmed back a few times to accommodate it. So it's not the oldest tree in the park. Uh, that one is actually over in Storybook Land. We can get to that in a future video. But this is the longest residing tree on the Disneyland grounds. All right, again, right across from Jungle Cruise, if you go into the building here, we got Shrunken Ned. Shrunken Ned is the head shrink of the jungle for personal diagnosis and a souvenir. Please insert coins below. No one here works for free. Ah, oh, oh, good heaven. I haven't seen a case of this since I was Lord Kitchener's personal physician in the Crimea. You've got uh, Mogo on the Gogogo. The bad news is there's, there's no cure. Of course, the, of course, the good news is there's no disease either. <laughs> so just follow the instructions and in two weeks, uh, well, uh, you'll be worse than ever. <laughs> and thank you so much for patronizing Shrunken Ned, the jungle's only self-service witch doctor. <laughs> One of the cheapest souvenirs at Disneyland. While you're at the Bengal Barbecue, you can go take a look around and see lots of photos of the old SEA members, including this one that's probably the most interesting. This is Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn in a uh, photo that's taken from the African Queen. The film had a pretty heavy influence on the look and feel of the Jungle Cruise ride. And this onset photo has been edited to make it look like they're on a Jungle Cruise ride with the Zambezi Miss. They're looking for the trapped safari. And if you look closely, you can see that they also have a photograph of SEA member and proprietor of the Jungle Navigation Company, Dr. Albert Falls. And on board with them is Albert the Monkey, faithful companion of Lord Henry Mystic. So next time you're in there, check out that and lots of other SEA photos, memorabilia that are on the walls. You can go take a look at them as you get uncomfortably close to other families eating their beef skewers while you stare over their shoulders. There's a cool little attraction at the back of the uh, Adventureland Bazaar. If you go and you go right into the back wall, you have Aladdin's other lamp. So uh, yeah, what's whosoever rubs the lamp and places coins in the slot below. It doesn't work for free shall receive the wisdom of the genie and have their future revealed. Right. Fair. Ah, perfect mundo. Okay, let me get a look at you. Oh, you, my friend, are going to become so famous. Oh, I see you meeting and greeting world leaders. I, I see them shaking your hand and praising you, saying how great your Danish is. Danish, Danish. Oh, you. You're going to be the king of Denmark! <laughs> oh, my mistake, Sahib. You're not going to be the king of Denmark. You are going to make Danish pay.
taste tastes almost the same thing. Am I correct? <laughs> Listen, if you make deliveries, could you drop some Danish inside the lamp tomorrow? Maybe a cheesecake too? <laughs> Salam, my friend, and see you later. Watch the calories. A lot of people know that significant contributors to Disneyland get immortalized with windows on Main Street, but Adventureland has one window of their own. Harper Goff, one of Walt Disney's first Imagineers, uh, played a significant role in the design of Disneyland. And when touring Adventureland, you can see a tribute to him, a window displaying oriental tattooing by Professor Harper Goff and banjo lessons. Harper Goff's influence on Disneyland was immense. He uh, was an instrumental in creating iconic attractions like the Jungle Cruise and designing the Nautilus for the film 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So why banjo lessons? In addition to his Disney work, Harper was a talented banjo player. And the next time you listen to the Firehouse 5 Plus 2, you're listening to Harper on the banjo. I'm not going to go in depth into each ride because they each really have a history that's uh, rich and complex and deserves their own video, but I will go into some of the readily observable things from the queues and outside, including this tidbit from Indiana Jones, which is probably my favorite fact about Adventureland. Indiana Jones is built on what used to be the Disneyland parking lot, and Sala's projector room here was built on what was the Eeyore section of said parking lot. So when they built the attraction, they left a little memento of Eeyore up there. And honestly, it's really hard to see. With the standard lighting and angles, I can almost never see it. Unless you happen to find a really cool and accommodating cast member who had a flashlight handy and offered to show it to us. And even with flashlights, still a little bit hard to see, but uh, as a big Eeyore fan, it makes me happy just knowing he's up there. This truck behind me uh, in front of the Indiana Jones queue was an actual movie prop from the Raiders of the Lost Ark. And this isn't just some random truck that was in a background shot somewhere. This is in a pretty legendary action sequence in Raiders where Indy's chasing after the Ark in the back. It's personally owned by George Lucas, but he gifted it to Disneyland to be put on display. And you can see that there's actually a lever that was built into the truck that uh, opened up a little door so that stunt drivers could see where they were going while they were filming the fight scenes in the actual compartment. You can see into the back of the truck there. Unfortunately, uh, there's no arc there today. Not quite sure where that prop ended up. All right, then we're gonna go back over to the Jungle Cruise to explore a whole mess of connections to the SEA that's evident throughout the, uh, the ride in the queue here. So the Trap Safari scene, which was originally a pretty unassuming group of individuals, has now been recast with a new set of characters, and all of them have pretty extensive backgrounds that relate to the SEA. The Jungle Navigation Company, which was originally started by Dr. Albert Falls, who the waterfall is named after, uh, he disappeared and his granddaughter, Alberta Falls, has taken over at the JNC. You can see scenes of her offices throughout the queue, but the relation to the SEA doesn't end there. There's a whole cast of characters. Uh, we'll start with Rosa Soto Dominguez. She was a successful painter known as La Rosa, and uh, she was close friends with Alberta Falls, the president of the JNC. In being a woman painter from Mexico City, uh, Rosa it may be influenced by historic painter Frida Kahlo, and she'd often send Alberta artistic presents, including sculptures and a painting of Alberta outside of Inspiration Falls. Rosa sending Alberta gifts of flower pieces and paintings of her likeness may imply that she and Rosa were in some form of relationship. And Rosa could be seen being run up the pole by the rhinos here with her art supplies on her back. As you look around the ride queue, you'll also see a collection of butterflies and other insects from world-famous entomologist Kan Chunosuke. Alberta invited him along on the VIP Jungle Cruise, and he ended up on the totem pole right above Rosa. Then, as you get off the cruise, you can see a series of crates and uh, carnivorous plants that belong to Dr. Leonard Moss. Dr. Moss had a workspace around the Amazon River base for his studies of carnivorous plants of Adventureland, and some of the larger specimens uh, ended up escaping from the cages. On the totem pole, you can see him with one of his specimens on his back. And then part of the safari, you also have Felix Peckman the Eighth. He's the Jungle Navigation Company skipper. And uh, at the very top, you have Siobhan Puffin Murphy. And she's a bird watcher and may have been responsible for getting the whole group run up the pole as she tried to get a better look at an ox pecker on a grumpy rhinoceros. So we'll end over at the treehouse here. And uh, of course, it used to be Swiss Family Robinson. Then it became Tarzan's treehouse. Now it's going back to Swiss Family Robinson. So it's under construction. Hopefully it will be open later in 2023. 
Fun fact, the tree actually has an official scientific name. It's the Disney Dendron Semperflorens Grandis, and that translates roughly into large, ever-blooming Disney tree. Concept art for the new treehouse shows an SCA flag hanging from one of the rooms, so it's uh, pretty likely there will be a handful of other references to the SCA spread throughout the treehouse once it opens up. Adventurelands, one of my favorite places to rope drop, but uh, you know what? It's when the sun goes down and all these torches get lit that uh, the atmosphere really pops. Thanks for coming along. Hopefully soon I can do a deep dive into each of these rides or perhaps another land, but you know, honestly, it took me six weeks to get around to this after doing the uh, New Orleans Square video, so, but if you subscribe, then uh, hopefully it'll end up in your feed once it finally gets done. Until then, take care of yourself, take care of everybody else, and hope to see you out at the parks. Yeah, that sign with the tiki torches just kind of hits different, doesn't it? Don't look like a vlog or creep. Film your families while they eat. Adventureland. Right. Adventureland. You sound like a 1970s TV announcer. Next week on Adventureland. <laughs>